Bergson and the Holographic Theory of Mind. We'll be looking at Neuralink versus Bergson. Take a look at Neuralink's workings briefly via the impulses and some of the hopes. City recognition proposed. Really? Memories are erased? Not so fast. Knowledge transmission? What would this actually mean? Adding two plus three is way worse than AI thinks. And in general, the false aura that AI will obtain and is obtaining via Neuralink. So quite recently, Elon Musk and his team presented their progress on Neuralink. As everyone knows, this is a chip technology and insert into the brain that promises an AI brain interface. How vast is this promise? What is its scope? What can it do with thought, consciousness, perception? Imaginations, projections, and fears have already run wild. Fears. In scanning for info on Neuralink, I, I hit this video. The future after Neuralink, my thoughts as a master of neurobiology by Judy Neptune. Judy is a um, student in neurobiology, getting her master's degree. Actually, it was made a year before Elon's recent presentation. The aura of AI merged now with Neuralink is clearly deeply concerning to her. To quote, when Neuralink works and everything has it, everyone has it, what is the point of life anymore? When everyone has the knowledge, when you don't have to go to school and you don't have to take tests to prove your knowledge anymore, you can just access anything you want to at all times. Or when you're sad about something, you can just program your mind to forget it. And to quote, I don't understand a life where we don't have to spend all of our time learning and studying, where we can just upload all those things to our brain. She has enough neurobiology knowledge to know that the brain is massively complicated. In truth, it's a black box to science. But she wonders, will science just ignore this, just charge ahead? All knowledge uploaded at will, memories erased. How far can this go? Lex Friedman laid out a vast vision of hopes. Look at that list there on, that he's going to go through in this video. On the list, consciousness and intelligence. He says to quote, it will help attack the hard problem. It will take the problem out of the philosophical realm and put it into the scientific realm. I can make some comments on that, but we won't. And then note the memories and immortality. Quote, the ability to save and replay memories or save and replay mind states, improving the resolution of that memory replay to save mental states and to transfer to other systems, to robots. So I guess Lex can uh, will, will be downloading his Russian nature to uh, our robot there. All discussion of this subject takes place in the ubiquitous AI slash mind equal machine framework. So let's go for a change and look for the Burks and Gibson framework. Now other people have noted that this, this has in reality been done before. It's just a lot better. Per Musk though, the brain has two layers, the limbic system which does emotions, needs, wants, the cortical system, which is thinking and planning. A third layer will now be Neuralink. This is a digital superintelligence layer augmenting our cells with computers and eventually AI, according to the uh, lore. We kind of already have this layer, our phones, our laptops. The bottleneck it's perceived to be is we have to type, use a mouse or speak. This is a low bandwidth form of interface. Hence a BMI, a brain machine interface, much faster, thus Neuralink. A brain consists of neurons firing all the time in response to electrical signals, sent when we hear, see, move, talk, or think. So we have firing, neurons firing, and whenever a neuron fires from one of these signals, a tiny electromagnetic field is present. I'm just using standard images here. Neuralink is going to tap into these tiny electric fields. So we're going to put an electrode next to the fields, actually tons of electrodes, tons of fields. 
it will interpret this analog data as ones and zeros to be used in the digital world. A neuron pulses will be detected using tiny probes about one-tenth the diameter of a human hair. Each probe will be installed by a robot. It will be so it will not burst blood vessels or cause other damage. This is one of the major advances of the Neuralink group, this robot. The deep brain stimulation, though, has been done before for Parkinson's patients. It's just going to be a whole lot safer. Look at the size comparison of the probes in the Neuralink case, very small. These electrodes need to be less than 60 microns away from away to detect the uh, EM field and serve to read data from the brain and send data to it. The process that makes this all work is the N1 chip. The N1 chip reads analog signals, amplifies them, digitizes them, and sends them out to a pod device behind the ear. Actually, this is the, the first uh, uh, vision of what they were going to do. The pod device is going to be replaced. The N1 chip can read 20,000 brain samples per second. So these are real world signals on, on the left there, hooked to, the, hooked, hooked to an N1 coming from the brain. So these have to be analyzed and we're looking for spikes. So neurolinkers are looking for spikes in voltage when a neuron fires. This is what they're going to capture. An algorithm can detect these spikes in real time, decode them, and make sense of the vast amounts of data. So we're looking for these electromagnetic field spikes or impulses. The system can read and write data. To do this, a signal is run through an electrode near a neuron causing the neuron to fire. So we're sending an EM pulse near a neuron to cause it to fire. This too has been done since the late 1950s with cochlear implants. So the information input to the brain does not have to be perfect because of neuroplasticity. The brain learns how to use the new information. So current applications, we have closed loop therapies, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, future, add-on depression, chronic pain, tinnitus, future, future, movements, so as sensation, vision, spatial maps, and then we get even larger speech and language, mood, pain, hunger and thirst, memory, even mathematical reasoning. So we're veering to that large vision that AI can do all. The original plan, the picture up on the right, to connect four chips, thousands of electrodes each, and signals will be sent to Bluetooth via Bluetooth to a pod device behind the ear and controlled via a phone. The ear thingy will now be a chip at the top of the skull. The first goal for patients to control a phone, a mouse or a computer keyboard. This too has already been accomplished via the Utah electrode array. So the first application for Neuralink will be to tap into the primary motor cortex, that part of the brain that connects to the spinal cord and sends signals to initiate movement. And this can be extended then to hands to arms and even speech. Future stages, understand and treat brain diseases, preserve and enhance one's own brain, full brain machine interfaces, an application store for apps to control your brain. For example, download memories of someone familiar with the city when you're, you're brand new in the city. So we've seen the elements already. That last application is an interesting place to start. Download memories of someone familiar with the city. And say who? Could be Mr. Rat. He knows the city. So we'll see. So the feeling of familiarity. Feeling of familiarity with the city. This is interesting because to me, we're verging here on Bergson's two forms of recognition implicitly. The first automatic recognition, the feeling of familiarity feeling familiarity created by an organized motor accompaniment formed over time, now automatic, and linked to the form of the visual velocity flow. Remember the flow fields, Gibson's flow fields, a gradient velocity vectors. And I noted as I walk down my driveway every day, 
toward the barn. There's a flow, and over time, linked to that visual flow is the motor accompaniment, which makes sense given we've got the visual system receiving an input from the uh, optic array that's feeding to the motor systems, the motor areas which feeds back, modulates the visual system so we have a resonant feedback loop, shall we say, uh, reentrant areas all feeding to the motor areas and supporting that feeling of motor uh, familiarity to organize motor accompaniment. Now, attentive recognition is a circuit. And here we have the virtual, the uh, 4D experience for Enberg's model. Remember, we're 4D beings. And the virtual is flooded into present perception due to the resonant state of that brain. It's filling in. So we're seeing the coffee cup, but we're reintegrating past experiences of the coffee stirring, and those are flooding in according to the structure of that current event. Remember, that's an invariant structure, a complex structure with velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, inertial tensors as we stir the coffee. So it's filling in, amplifying the details. We discussed this heavily in number 31 language, but it's a circuit, it's a conscious circuit, the flow of past experience into the present, forming a recognition on that basis. Of course, this works in distinction and the concept of a motor accompaniment based familiarity utterly ignored in cognitive science. Yet I find it interesting that we're verging toward this with Neuralink. Now, this corresponds to two distinct memory loss syndromes, or what's termed dissociations. In one, automatic recognition is impaired. A patient can recall images of the city, but when placed there, feels no familiarity. The link between perception and the organized accompaniment appears to be broken then. So I can remember things, I can remember, recall images of the, of the, of the uh, environment, but feel no familiarity. That more organized motor accompaniment that creates that feeling is gone. Attentive recognition impaired. Here a patient can move to the city, feels familiarity, but no memory images of the city can be recalled. So here the circuit is broken and the apparatus supporting that circuit. What does Neuralink have to work with? Well, correlations and only correlations. I'm walking down that driveway. Neuralink records the EM activity as I walk down the driveway. I take a right to the garage, take another right to the house. That activity, of course, is the visual areas and the reentry connections to the motor areas, modulating the visual areas, that whole reciprocal re-entered feedback, including the uh, entire body. So we have to analyze that spike activity. That's all we have. The spike activities which we're correlating to the actual experience. So, so we record it for replay. It'll be a train of electromagnetic pulses, my little symbol for it, the train of EM pulses. Now take Susan, who's never seen the place. She's at the start of the driveway. So she downloads Steve's farm app. It starts playing in her brain, driving her motor systems to walk down the driveway. Is this automatic recognition? Is there going to be such? Hmm. Let's remember, AI is based in the classic metaphysics, the abstract space where time is a fourth dimension, a series of instants, instance of space each with a time extent of a mathematical point. The abstract space, again, a 4D space of points slash instants. Each 3D space, a space of points, continuum, points, positions, and the fourth dimension, a dimension of instants. So time becomes a series of instantaneous 3D blocks where we can take each block, there is the all of space. Each block, is falling into non-existence, into the past, as the next, the present appears. That is, 
when space two arrives, space one disappears. When space three arrives, space two disappears into the non-existence of the past. The truth is only one block ever present with a mathematical time extent of a mathematical point. So both automatic and attentive recognition require a continuous flow, indivisible, the temporal metaphysic, not discrete instance. So AI is playing a game here, surreptitiously relying on the metaphysic in which the brain dwells. But pretending AI's framework, its metaphysic is operative, is correct. But no, this is not the case. In other words, Neuralink, even if we can get this recognition in Susan, is not actually validating AI. Take another event, our, our coffee stirring. What would be automatic recognition of coffee stirring? Suppose we've never done it before. Remember, Susan has never seen coffee stirring. So first, record my electromagnetic firings while coffee stirring. Oops, there's that invariant structure defining coffee stirring, a multimodal invariant structure. The velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, etc., inertial tensors. I have to record from all over the brain. And to replay in Susan, it must be all in sync at all areas of her brain over time. If you can do this, will this bring the feeling of familiarity with coffee stirring? This is a bit of a deja vu. It reminds me of roughly 1972 when the whole mind as computer swept into uh, academics while I was an innocent graduate student. Trick in 1972 and 1975, I pondered early AI. What could it actually do? Can it really equal mind? I looked at a paper, a program that could design devices. Now, I've described this before, but it's re relevant again. It was called Functional Reasoning in Design by Freeman and Newell in 1971. And they described a database or a theoretical database where you would have objects and list of features, provisions, functional provisions and functional requirements. So you have a blade, for example, it provides cutting, but it requires being held. And then a handle, it provides holding. So it program using means ends analysis, it matched functional provisions of objects to functional requirements. Doing this matching, it could design a knife. Now I'd seen creativity tests for engineers, create a mousetrap from a set of things like a pile of components like string, boxes, pencils, razor blades, rubber bands, toothpicks, some cheese. Yes, this is the heart of the common sense knowledge problem. The properties, features, physical properties and features of all these objects under transformation, as we'll see. Could, could Freeman and Newell's program do this, create a mousetrap or something functionally equivalent? I quickly saw, no, there could be no exhaustive list of the possible functional provisions of objects. You cannot have an exhaustive database. But now the fun began fun for now you were trying to do the thinking for the ai folks could they just list all the features of objects but features become functions of transformations as you consider what you can do with the pencil or the rubber bands or the string or the box features emerge under transformations could they list all the possible transformations as you thought about it it became doubtful in fact no, can't be done. What else could they do? Hmm. Well, down the road, AI just dropped the problem of common sense knowledge for a long time, like it didn't exist. It, it was bad. So the thinking I was trying to do for them, my point being, uh, was indeed the thinking that had to be done, but it got so bad, it was dropped. Deep learning came along and injected hope. But in reality, not. We saw 
Jan Lacoon thinking about how he can make his neural nets do this, but it was pretty clear it wasn't going to happen. What he was striving to do is come up with a set of principles that constitute an impossibility proof, an impossibility forced by their framework. This is a tough exercise. It was the same thing for the connectionist nets, same exercise. This, in my opinion, is where we are with this particular thrust of AI slash neural link. This particular thrust being driving the brain via, driving brain patterns via electromagnetic spike trains, as I like to call it. The critic is forced to do all the thinking on what might be done. Well, I've tired of this, so we must live with my limitations on the amount of thought given to it. The old experience download, something we've seen that was surely going to be attributed to Neuralink as a possibility. We've already seen, as we considered Susan, sending in electromagnetic pulses via Neuralink, you are perhaps redintegrating an existing experience, perhaps merely stimulating via creating modulation patterns, a pseudo experience like Walter Penfield's electrical stimulation. Remember, Penfield experiments via electrical stimulation of the cortex, he could stimulate dreamlike memories or imagery. But these were not actual previously experienced events, nor believed as such by the subjects. Penfield himself came to reject the concept that he was stimulating memories stored in the cortex. At best, your pulse Pulses are creating a reconstructive wave pattern through 4D experience, as we're showing there, specific to a specific experience. But are you also saying it's a sufficient pattern to force an explicit memory, that is, a conscious localizing of the event in your past? This requires a dynamic state involving also the prefrontal cortex, what I've called an articulated simultaneity, a state linking both the present event, there actually is none, and the past event in a whole, What's, what Weisskranz termed the, termed the past by present correlation. All this, as I discussed, requires a brain flowing in indivisible time that is intricately embedded in the indivisible transformation of the holographic field. We'll talk about this in a second. Thus operate in an entirely different metaphysical framework, a brain that is not interested in the classic metaphysic of AI. Again, AI is going to be surreptitiously taking credit for this. AI's framework and its metaphysic has nothing to do with it. An experience is the 40 extent of our being Erasing it is a non-starter. What could be done? What might Neuralink do? Yep, again, we have to speculate. We record Susan remembering coffee on her birthday. Now we start, the, when the start of the pattern is detected, we download impulses that interfere, that stop it. But this is not erasing experience. Suppose we can do this. AI, with its classic metaphysic framework, will use this accomplishment to reinforce its mystique. Take downloading knowledge. Again, what could be done? What might Neuralink do? The problem is the scope of what knowledge is. is huge. Add two plus three. Find the square root of 5,492. What are the capitals of the 50 states? Where is Tanzania? Prove that the sum of two hexagonal, hexagonal numbers always equals a cube. Write a Java program to compute balances. Describe the events of the Revolutionary War. Build a chicken coop. Cook a ratatouille. So take a simple, ask Neuralink, what is two plus three? Does Neuralink send the impulses which make one hear five? So you've got the answer. But this is not knowledge of how to add. We're learning by taking, say, two chickens and three chickens, counting them, and it's five. But it's much more complex than this. Remember Kassir and his 
a phasic patient. Given a set of things to count, he could progress in order. If he had arrived, for example, at six, he had no comprehension that he had a designation for the quantity thus far achieved, that is, a cardinal number. When asked which of two numbers are larger, say 12 or 25, many of phases, phases can do so only by counting through the whole series, determining that in this process, the word 25 came after the number 12. to quote Kassir, where quantity no longer stands before us as a sharply articulated multiplicity. It cannot be strictly apprehended as a unity, as a whole built up of parts. So we'll shift to adding seven plus three for Neuralink. The little schema there shows what he's, Kassir is getting at. To achieve seven plus three, every number must carry a dual role. We're taking the first numbers one through seven, but now seven be becomes the zero point. Thus to find the, the num of, num sum of seven plus three, or the difference seven minus three, the number seven while retaining its position in the first series of seven is now taken in a new meaning, becoming the starting point of a new series where it assumes the role of zero. Again, the fundamental unities must be kept fixated, but precisely in this fixation be kept mobile so that it remains possible to change from one to the other. The number seven must maintain its meaning as seven, yet simultaneously assume the meaning of zero. This is a pure problem of representation in time. More precisely, it is a problem of representation in an extended time, in an indivisible time, supporting true simultaneity. As I argued, this requires a brain integrally part of an indivisibly transforming field, an indivisible flow. And this is what Neuralink would be, well, is it even achieving this? This developmental trajectory is described in Piaget in the child's conception of number. But let's have Neuralink, quote, give us, quote, the knowledge on this Piaget, this Piaget question. Neuralink, if I rotate the tunnel seven times, in what order will the beads come out? And as we, we have a tunnel, we push three colored beads in, a, we'll call them A, B, and C. We discussed this before. And then we rotate the tunnel, a half rotation, 180 degree rotation. What order will the beads come out? Rotate it, and of course, with one rotation, they come out with an inverse order. What happens if I do four times or nine times? So this is a test given to children, age three to seven, and there's a developmental trajectory. The child comes to a point of development where it can visualize, or he can visualize, the consequence of a 180-degree rotation, which moves ABC to CBA, and then another 180-degree rotation, which moves things back again to ABC. That is an invariance of order under a 360 degree rotation. We now ask in which order would the beads come out when the tunnel is semi-rotated five or four or six or seven times? He yeah, this is a great difficulty. Some children appear to be exhausted after imagining three or possibly four semi-rotations. They're exhausted. They're imagining this and they become lost when jumps are made from one number to another. For example, from three half turns to now five half turns. Continuing my question, but since the child upon each half turn endeavors to follow the inversion in every detail in his thoughts, he only gradually manages accurately to forecast the result of three, four, five half turns. Once this game of visualizing the objects in alternation is set in train, he finally discovers that upon each half turn, the order changes once more. Only the fact that up to this upper limit, the subject continues to rely on visualizing intuitively and therefore needs to image one by one the half turn is proved because he is lost when a jump is made from one number of half turns to any other. 
So this leads to Piaget's notion of concrete operations. This massive dynamic of thought that underlies this answer to this simple question. He says operations, one might say, are nothing other than articulated intuitions, rendered adaptable and completely reversible since they are emptied of their visual content and survive as pure intention. In other words, operations come into being in their pure state when there is sufficient schematization. Thus, instead of demanding actual representation, each inversion will be conceived as a potential representation, like the outline for an experiment to, to be performed, but which is not useful to follow to the letter, even in the form of performing it mentally. Underlying these simple forms of knowledge, then, there's a dynamic developmental trajectory of neural organization, and that's the only part of it, that requires several years supporting continuous indivisible transformations, what I've called articulated simultaneities requiring an indivisible continuously flowing time, not the time of discrete instance, the classic metaphysic of the AI, that is all operating in the framework of a temporal metaphysic, that is Bergson's. To give the actual, the true knowledge, Neuralink would have to impart all of this via its EM impulses, repulses, that is, they would have to permanently embed this organizational structure, the resultant of this three to uh, three, seven year age organizational pattern or path trajectory. Not a series of on demand whenever asked for EM impulse or pulses. So this goes back to number five on explicit memory, a question we ask for. Mr. Robot, the brain requires years for this dynamical development, but you don't. Why? Now, this appears more salient in the context of symbolic AI, which we were sort of discussing that, where AI is just one shot creating the knowledge via its symbolic programming. But deep learning and connectionism are in reality doing nothing like Piaget describes either. Because, no, they involve no images. And we'll see why this is quite important. These simple forms are the basis of mathematical knowledge. Without them, if you're just relying on Neuralink, you are creating a nation, nay, a world, given Neuralink's ambitions, of mathematical Dumpkoffs. Let's say Neuralink, download a proof that the sum of two successive hexagonal numbers always equal a cubical number. As we've seen many times, this is Penrose's exercise. His visual form of a proof of a competition that does not stop, adding successive hexagonal numbers always equals a cubical number. We're folding a hexagonal, num hexagonal number like 19 into a three-sided structure, a cube. We stacked it over the previous structure also, and we get a cube, cube after cube after cube, cubical number. Is Neuralink going to download EM pulses that accomplish this form of understanding? And does it stick as a mental achievement for future use? One could go on, physics, biology, chicken coop construction. Why, mouse traps, back to that again, Neuralink. I want to make a mousetrap from these components I've got here. Where is the knowledge going to be? Can the rat do this? Neuralink, how can I defeat this trap? Interesting. You saw that Lashley, Carl Lashley, sliced, removed chunks, sliced and diced, the brain, but nowhere could he find where a behavior was stored. No way could he eliminate the behavior. Had, had the rat learned the maze to find the hamburger, there was no way he could eliminate that. Even with the cortex gone, the motor cortex, the rat would drag himself by hook or by crook to get that hamburger. There are many other examples along these lines. And we noted on the way, Lashley destroyed AI's connectionist net model as he did so. 
known network and its learned links and weights could survive his assault. Technically, the neural net model was destroyed long ago. We saw in the example of learning the dance or a piano piece or a T maze for that matter, Bergson's concept of the dynamic scheme. It is an image or scheme, non-physical, that guides the behavior to which the separate components of the behavioral act are all coordinated. Note, therefore, the scheme cannot be destroyed, for example, by Lashley. So download Chopin's Waltz in C-sharp minor. The rat plays it, or better, maybe we should say it plays the rat. Is the knowledge now stored? Why is it not just a passing one-off experience? It's not really there. He has to have that download all the time. The knowledge is actually the, the, the dynamic scheme with, with its ability to bring about the coordinated actions of the body. We've seen these knowledge not of the brain examples in several of these vids. Remember Rupert's test with rats in Harvard. Rats learned to escape a water maze. The more rats learning it, the easier it was for those following along. Somehow the rats following were improving. Enter Edinburgh and Melbourne. But the, the rats took up where the Harvard rats left off at the same point of proficiency. Some getting it right the very first time. At Melbourne, rats from untrained parents still showed the same effect. That is, this was not being passed through the genes. As Rupert says, all similar rats learn quicker, just as morphic resonance, his theory of morphic resonance would predict. We show how that related to Bergson. An EM pulse train could look like this. It looks like it could perhaps drive the rat. His motor response is to climb out of the, of the, of the uh, water maze. It could drive the escape behavior, but it is not the knowledge. Very doubtful. These problems have their source in this. AI actually has no theory of no theory of what experience actually is. That is the hard problem, which, as I've said, is more precisely described as the origin of the image of the external world with all its qualia. Nothing in that image is not qualia. We've seen Bergson's model. He said there's no photograph, certainly no photograph in the brain back in 1896. Rather, the photograph is already developed in the very heart of things and at all point in space. In other words, he was pointing to the fact that the universe is a holographic field and the brain, as we construe it, a modulated reconstructive wave. Holographic reconstruction, we're sending a wave through the holographic plate, say frequency one, specifying a stored wavefront of a cube. Modulate to frequency two, we get the cup. Modulate to frequency three, a wine glass, back to frequency one, again, the cube. So the brain as a wave specific to a source within the field. Right where it says it is external within the field and at a scale of time, buzzing fly, versus a fly slowly flapping his wings. Again, a very concrete wave, hence as concrete as an AC motor. The lesson here, experience is not occurring solely within the brain. Therefore, it cannot be stored there, nor is knowledge. Add in that the holographic field, thus along with it, our bodies, our beings, is transforming indivisibly. There are no discrete instants of time, each falling into the past as the next so-called so -called present instant arises. We are 4D beings. Our experience is 4D. Our being is 4D. AI and Neuralink's pretensions to be AI are totally in the wrong framework for a theory of mind. It will be interesting. Symbolic AI reigned supreme trick in 1968, 1985, rough years. The common sense knowledge problem 
and the frame problem, both the same problem, are simply faded, put out of sight. Connectionism reigned roughly 1985 to 2017, still reigns in, in its way. It was ubiquitous, but it was hitting a wall. But by ubiqu ubiquitous, I mean it was being applied to everything they could apply it to, uh, <clears throat> cognitive-wise, perception-wise. But it was hitting a wall. Deep learning came to the rescue due to its automation of backpropagation, 2017 to whenever. And the deep learning folks are trying to marry back the symbolic AI, as we've seen. And realizing again, they still face common sense, common sense knowledge. Now we have Neuralink with the impulse trains derived from neural patterns correlated to knowledge, action correlated. Yes, there will be progress. Great affirmations of AI will be claimed and they will begin to hit the real nature of knowledge again. But the fundamental misguidedness of AIs, this classic metaphysic framework for mind, this will never be admitted. So next we'll see. Till then, signing off.